السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه حمدا يليق بجلال وجهه وبعظيم سلطانه وصلى الله على خير خلقه محمد الصادق الأمين المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اكتبنا منهم آمين اللهم زدني علما اللهم آتي نفسي تقواها وزكيها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها My dear brothers and sisters, we start with the praise and glorification of the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your Lord and mine. And we send the choices of prayers and blessings on his noble messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his family and his companions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who follow them in the right way. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the purification of our nufus, for our, of our inner selves, because Allah is the guardian and the protector of the nafs. Before we start, I'd like to see a show of hands how many of you know about Tazkiyatun Nafs, how many of you have attended lectures or courses about it, how many of you practice some or all aspects of it. So any of those so that I know what the audience is. So a few. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So what I'm going to try and do in this first session and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in our time, is to give you an introduction on this, uh, so that we are all on the same page. Let's ask a question, what makes us human? What makes us different than every animal out there? They eat, we eat. They drink, we drink. They sleep, we sleep. They reproduce, we reproduce. So what makes us who we are? Human beings. Yes? Free will. Free will, our sister says. So let's go back into the genesis of man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his wisdom and we are latecomers in the universe all of this has been in existence they tell us billions of years maybe 14 billion or 15 billion years we have come towards the end of that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our father from clay from stinking mud and he lay in that form for a long time and then at some point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the angels to do sajda to Adam alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran when he did that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ نَفَخْتُهُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُولَهُ سَاجِدِينَ when we had blown from our life-giving spirit into this, the ruh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them, now you fall in prostration, and they all fell in sajda except Iblis. So that's what ennobles us, that till that material form was there, the angels were not asked to prostrate, to do sajda. It was when that ennobling spirit, the ruh, was infused into this, was blown into this, clay structure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ennobled him as a human being and asked the angels to do sajda. And we're not going to go into the detail of what that sajda means. Obviously it was not a sajda of worship. Okay, it was just to honor him. 
and sajda has been in previous traditions, including for the people of the book, not as an act of worship. Okay. So that's what makes us human. That's what makes us the best of his creation is our ruh. It's not our material self. We all know we are made of two components. That which comes from the earth, which is our bodies, which is satisfied and needs things of the world, like food and drink and so on and so forth. That it seeks and is satisfied by searching for things for its survival that are earthly. But what ennobles us, our ruh, has no need for food or drink. In fact, the ruh feels better when we are fasting. Okay. Because the ruh finds its satisfaction from where it came, from a heavenly dimension, from its connectedness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's where it came from. So its dimensions of happiness and satisfaction and needs are not of the worldly things. And that's why we find no matter what many people achieve of this dunya, they still, many of them, do not feel internally satisfied. Because the dunya is finite. It's limited. And its attractions continue. They cannot be satisfied. So even if you keep gaining all of these, you do not achieve satisfaction. The proof of that is, you always want more. If you have a million, you want a billion. If you have a billion, you want 10 billion. If you have 10 billion, you want 100 billion. What is that proving to you? That the ruh which comes from the infinite cannot be satisfied by what is finite. Okay? That's why Rasulullah in the most beautiful and simple way he tells us that giving us an example that the stomach giving us sort of signifying by the stomach our desires of the human being can never be filled. If he has one valley of gold he wants a second one. And the only thing that will fill it is death, which is the mud of the grave. In other words, there is no satisfaction. Which brings us to the concept of happiness. We are all seeking happiness. What is happiness, if we define that? Happiness is the attainment and achievement by whatever you want to look at, by things which are by its nature. For example, for the eyes, what is the happiness of the eyes? If you put a perfume in front of the eyes, or there is perfume in this room, do you think the eyes will find happiness and satisfaction? No, because that's not its nature. But if you see something beautiful, the eyes feel that. For the nose, it's the smell. For the taste, it's food, and so on and so forth. So we have different dimensions of happiness, what gives you satisfaction and contentment according to the nature. And the happiness, the real happiness of the qalb, of the ruh, is its connectedness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it is not connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing else can fill that void. And that's why those who are not connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are always looking for more toys to fill that void and that void will never be filled. Okay. If you're looking for happiness where it is not placed, we are not going to find it. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he sent our father back to this, or sent our father to this earth. So, what does that mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this earth for a purpose. And he created us for a purpose. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does has wisdom and a purpose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, the answer to the question that everybody asks, because it's the nature of the human being to know why I am here, who am I? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers that in one ayah. 
وما خلقت الجن والانس الا ليعبدون that I have not created jinns or mankind for any other purpose except for my ubudiyah, for my worship. And the worship is a very general term in Islam. It's not just your salah and salam and hajj. So that's the purpose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the whole universe to help us to serve that purpose of ubudiyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our whole life here, which is limited, even if we live a hundred years, it's a very short time. And some of us who are in their 50s and 60s, it seems like yesterday, okay, that we were little kids, you know. I, a week ago I was in Lucknow and I saw the streets where I was in college, you know, that's more than 40 years ago, and it seems like yesterday. Nuh alayhi salam, lived more than 950 years on the day of judgment he will be asked just giving us an example how long did you stay on earth he will say yawm or aw ba'd yawm like a day or part of a day in relative sense that's what it will seem like okay and none of us i can guarantee you will live 950 years okay for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a frame of reference that life is short. This is a, we are not permanent resident. We are not citizens of this earth. Even though we say we have a permanent residence or this is my home. This is not my home. My home is where? My home is where my father came from, where my ancestor came from. And my whole life is my journey back to the home from where Adam alayhi salam, where my ruh was created. Our whole journey, whole life is that journey back to where we came from. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam taught us, he says, Kung fit dunya ka anna ka gharib aw abir as sabil. Live in this world as if you're a stranger. You don't belong here. Or you are a traveler, that's even less. He doesn't put his residence anywhere. He knows his destination is ahead. So how, what is this journey? And this is the journey for which all of the Anbiya came to teach us that this, we, our life has a purpose. It's to get back. I am here so that I can get back. I am a displaced person. I am a refugee of Jannah. And I need to get back to my home. You know, today, throughout the world, there are refugees. After 50 years of, of Philistine, and what do they want to do? They want to go back home. We should feel a greater urge. I really want to get back home, which is Jannah. How do we go on this journey? And that's what this whole thing is all about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this world so that in this world everything that we see are signs. Whether they are physical things such as what we see around the skies, the stars, the moon, the sun or things that happen, events. Everything is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything is meant to help us know our creator. So the creation, and by creation we means, mean everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was meant to unveil the cre creator. That you see the sky and you see the creation of, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you say, Subhanallah, who could have raised these without pillars and nothing happens and this has been going on for billions of years who created this sun with such perfection who created this moon to show us phases of the month and no matter what we look at the oceans the mountains the greenery the creatures on the earth under the earth in the heavens everywhere everything from the smallest creature now you have all of these uh, wonderful movies they show you about these little little creatures things under the ocean you know to teach us the beauty of the Creator. In the ocean, some of the most beautiful fish in the most beautiful colors are there. And they tell us that they can see colors. 
They're created to show you what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to see. That you say, you say, the moment you see that, a heart that's pure, nothing comes up. When you see anything, the only thing that naturally comes out is Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And it should come from, it should come automatically. Because the heart that is purified sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas the heart that's not purified, that same creation, the same thing, becomes a veil from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An atheist or any denier who doesn't see Allah, doesn't acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sees the same thing, will find a reason for it. And explore. Oh, this is like this. The earth moved, yes, because they're tectonic plates and they're drifting apart and the pressure builds up. They will always look at the process and they will not look beyond as who has made the laws and rules and regulation that such things happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions his ayat in the Quran about the creation of the heavens and the earth. The creation within ourselves. And he says that I will show you my signs in the, in the, in the, in the heavens and within yourselves. He keeps, you know, the more science advances, the more you see. The more you see. The more you should be in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why do we not see that? Because the instrument that is used to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has become distorted or cloudy or dusty. And that's our heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the qalb. So what I'm going to do is give you a schematic. I hope people in the back can see this. I don't know if it's big enough. Just to put some terms here because we are all beginners and I should also uh, tell you very clearly that I'm just conveying to you what I have learned from my shuyukh. This is not something that I have originated. I don't claim that I have achieved any of these goals or tazkiya that we are talking about. I am just like you, a murid a seeker and hoping that one day by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I will achieve some of this and there is nobody who and there may be many people he, here who are much further along but today it was it's my turn to, to remind you and me of this so it does not imply any of that and especially with the introduction that was given it was a good introduction because what my sheikh said was that he has a hub of the dunya because he drives fancy cars and you cannot have hub of dunya and hub of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same heart so he's telling you this my state and then he's telling you that he drives fast and speed is equated with who? shaitan so he's telling you the right assessment There are certain terms that we use in the process of tazkiya and the word tazkiya as you know comes from zakah is from the same root zakat is from the same root means to purify to increase it even means when you prune a tree when you cut certain parts of a tree why do you do that so that it grows properly okay so now we are talking about this process which we'll get into there are certain terms that are used some of them are used interchangeably in some if you read some of the literature the word ruh and qalb and naf sometimes are used interchangeably however some of the scholars have tried to sort of tease it out into different just for our understanding and these are not physical things within the body because these are all things of the unseen okay when we use the word qalb which is translated loose, loosely as the heart we are not talking about the physical heart which is a piece of flesh as Rasulullah said but we are talking about the spiritual heart which is in which is a dimension that cannot be described in material terms 
has, is somehow linked to the physical heart because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used that word. When we use the word ruh, which is the life-giving spirit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the soul as some people translate it, uh, again, it's not something if the material world, it's not of this four-dimensional world of, you know, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, because it's not limited by time. Okay? When a person dies, we know the ruh is extracted, we don't see anything leaving, the doors may be locked, windows are locked, nothing leaves, we don't see, but it's gone. Similarly, when we talked about the nafs, this is again our inner instincts, desires and things that we are going to talk about in greater detail. That the qalb is the sovereign, is the king within us. The qalb is the one that ultimately decides, chooses. And the qalb has two influences, two major influences. It looks, you see the eye looking upwards because we want to put the ruh, the spirit, as up because it's of a heavenly dimension. It gets impulses from the ruh, which are angelic impulses from divine inspirations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts certain things in, in, in your heart and things. Similarly, the qalb is being fed constantly by our nafs, our lower self what we have made ourselves into. If it's a positive type of nafs, and, the, and all of these terms are mentioned in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes three kinds of nafs. Nafsul Ammara and Lawama and Mutma'in. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about ruh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about qalb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about aql. Aql if you want to call it intelligence, where is intelligence? We say, well, it's in the brain, but it's not something you can extract out. Okay? So, to understand this, the qalb is the sovereign. The aql, if you would, is the CEO. It carries out the, what the qalb decides is, and plans how it is to be done. And then it sends its impulses to the jawarah, to our limbs, to our eyes, to our tongue, to our ears, to parts of the body, of how to act. And we produce actions through that. So this uh, sort of diagram, uh, you can understand that if we want to purify our qalb, and that's a necessity, because we mentioned this in the khutbah yesterday, that Ibrahim salam in his dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ O oh Allah, do not disgrace me and dishonor me on the day when you will raise them. When you will raise us, the day of resurrection. Then he defines this day by saying يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَعْلُمْ وَلَا بَنُونَ A day in which all of our worldly possessions, he summarizes them in two things. Wealth and children. Because all of our struggles generally is for these two. That they will not benefit. The wealth will not benefit. As Rasulullah taught us, the meaning of the hadith is that your wealth is only that which you have used or sent for the Tomorrow, for tomorrow, by giving in sadaqah and spending in the right ways. The rest of what you call your wealth, I am worth one billion dollars, is not yours. That belongs to your inheritors. It's not yours. And what greater loss is for a person to have all of that, never use it, but on the day of judgment have to answer for it also. We call that a double whammy. Didn't benefit in the dunya and becomes an adab on the day of judgment. Because you have to answer for that. Among the Ashara Mubashara, the ten close companions of the Prophet ﷺ, there were some very wealthy people, one of whom was Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. Rasulullah once saw 
And he told Abdurrahman ibn Auf that I saw that my companions, because for Rasulullah these time things, dimensions were changed as you know. He was shown things that are going to happen, which is future for us, like the Jannah and the Nar and people in the Jannah and people in the Nar. He says, you, were, you took so long to come from judgment into Jannah that I got concerned. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I had to give accounting for all of my wealth. In another narration, after Rasulullah had passed away, one day there was a lot of turmoil in, in Medina. You know, whenever these big caravans used to come, you know, there was, you know, all of excitement. And our mother Aisha radiallahu anha said, what's going on? Said, the caravan from Syria has come, Abdul Rahman's caravan, it's bigger than this, loaded with this. And she just remarked, she said, I heard the Prophet said that he will enter Jannah crawling on his knees. So someone went and told Abdurrahman ibn Auf that this is what our mother has said. So he came, he left everything, he came, he said, O oh, Ummul Mu'mineen, I heard this. He said, yes, Rasulullah said this about you. So he went back, took the whole caravan, gave the whole thing in Sadaqah. Because he understood that what that meant was he would have to give an accounting. And this is from people who have been given the Bashara of Jannah. So no wealth is going to benefit. No children will benefit. And we know on that day, people, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us that scene, that they will turn away. Mothers from their children. Children, mothers and fathers and you know, the ones you say, you are my beloved, you are this and my love and you know, my valentine and whatever else you want to use. Completely disowned because it's a day of nafsi naf This is the status of the Anbiya. Nafsi, nafsi, me, me, me. The ultimate day of selfishness, of self-preservation. Because they are so scared. Nobody will benefit. Illa man atallahi bi qalbin salim. Except one. The only thing that benefits is you go back to Allah with that qalb that is sound. Salim. Salim means completely, completely preserved and sound from all traces of shirk in every form with nothing but pure tawheed in it. And how is that going to happen? That's what this whole str struggle is. The, the things that affect that state of the heart because a qalb that is completely salim sees things exactly for what they are okay when we talked about looking at the ayat the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his creation a qalb that is salim sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything everything that happens to me good and bad a qalb that is salim sees that and sees the real meaning behind it. You know, this world is a place of trial, of fitna. A qalb that, whose eyes are, are clear can see through the dust of the fitna. Oh, this fitna is coming? I know what it means. Even if it's the fit, ultimate fitna of Dajjal, a qalb that is salim will see on the forehead of Dajjal kafara. Nobody else will see it. It's not the physical eyes that are seen. It's the hearts. So our whole effort is to take back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a heart with which He sent us. Pure from everything except the greatness and glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The real tawheed. Tawheed is not a word. Tawheed is not a definition I can ask and everybody will give you. Tawheed means this, it's the oneness of Allah, it's this, is the absolute oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so forth and his rububiyya and his uluhiyya and his asma wa sifat. Those are still definitions. Tawheed, the real tawheed is that the heart sees only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in its way, in its own way and recognizes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the example of this in the ayah of Noor in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the heart of how, and He describes this shining clear glass. 
You see, when you look in a mirror, if it's nice and shining, what does it show you? It shows you exactly the image as to what it is. Now if you make it concave, I'm going to look smaller than I am. If you make it convex, I'm going to look bigger than I am. If you make it distorted, I may look like a monster. If there's dust settled on it, you say, yeah, it looks like there's a human being behind there. That's the state of our qulub. That we see things according to the state of our hearts. In another way, simple example. If you put on sunglasses that are red, what are you going to see? Everybody's going to look what? Red. You put on gr green, you are going to see things through the lens of your heart. If my heart is so corrupt and it has a disease, for example, of lying. Now you can bring a Siddiq radiallahu anhu in front of me and he says something because of the lens inside me, I'm going to think what? He's lying. Because that's all I know. I know I lie, therefore everybody else lies. So we need to bring ourselves at that level of balance where things are exactly as they are. That's why some of the scholars have described the state of the qalb as some of you may have seen, if you've ever been on a lake when there is no wind and no boats, it's completely still like glass. And I actually have pictures of things like that. And you can see all the mountains and all the trees as if it's a mirror. Because it's reflecting reality as it is. The reality of the world. And you go when there is a lot of turbulence. There are waves and winds and you know chopping. You can't see anything. And that's what our lives are. Either you can have a life of tranquility like a still lake where everything is clear to you and therefore you, you know what it is. Or it's in a state of turbulence and turmoil and stress and depression and anxiety and suicide and all of those things. It all depends on our inner state. I'm going to talk a little bit about the characteristics of the nafs. If we are going to use the word nafs as our self or, or our desires or our instincts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having made us from clay has put worldly needs and instincts within us. The moment the child is born, every hour and a half the child is crying because there is an instinct of hunger and thirst and comfort and so on and so forth. So these are things that we have. These are necessary but they need to be regulated. So there is the lowest level of the nafs, the animal-like nafs, which we can call animal or cattle-like nafs, or bahimi, nafsul bahima, like a cattle. What is the life of a cattle, like we said? Four things, a, cat, a cow or a goat will spend its time in four things. It's eating, drinking, sleeping, or reproducing. There's nothing else. They're not talking politics. They're not going, they don't have entertainment, this is their entertainment, this is their life. However, what they don't do, they're not thinking of taking over the next ranch. They're not thinking of killing people and things like that. This is the basic things. So if our 24-hour life is spent looking for food, drink, sleep, and satisfying our sexual desires, we are exactly like cattle. Okay? Now we said that these are our needs. When they become unregulated, okay, when that becomes my goal, that I have to have this, I have to have eat and eat and eat, then my stomach becomes like that of a cow. Right? and so on and so forth, without going into further details. That's one level. And again, why are we talking about this? 
in the process of Tazkiya, I have to tell you this also, is not for learning and teaching and lectures like I am doing. It is for me to reflect and for my correction. I am not here to correct you. I am just here to remind you and remind myself so that I may act on it. This is not, oh, I am listening to this. I have to go and tell my friend, she needs to do this. Or he, no, I need to do This is for me to have this standard here and see where do I fit. If 99% of my time is in the pursuit of these four things, which is what is in the West and now becoming here the same thing, then I should say I have a Bahimi Nafs. The next level lower than that, or worse, we are using that, is what is called Sab'i Nafs or predatory Nafs. Means there are animals that do the same four things, but they do something more. And they are killing. You know, like wolves and hyenas and tigers, they are also killing others. So if I have that trait also, wanting to harm others, and I don't care, the wolf will not kill one to satisfy it. If, if a wolf is left, let loose in a, in a uh, whatever you call it, the place where the, where the cows are or the sheep, it will kill ten. It will only eat one. So if my desire is, let me wipe out the competition. That's what we do in the corporate world, right? If my desire is that I don't care about anybody else, even if I have to harm them, then I have more than a bahimi nafs, I have a predatory or sab'i or a hyena like nafs. And then lowest, lower than that is a shaitani nafs. What are the characteristics of shaitan? Deception. Wanting to make laws and rule, rule the hearts of people. So if I'm among those who says, well, Allah says this, and I say, yeah, he says this, but I don't accept this, I don't understand this. Allah says this, this law of the Sharia is unjust. And we hear this, unfortunately, from some Muslims. You know, I don't believe in the Sunnah, I only believe in the Quran. Sounds words of ignorance. May Allah guide all of us. So that is a, a shaitani nafs. That's the worst. Because what is the job of shaitan? What did he promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, I will come from in front and from behind and from here and there. And to do what? To lead them astray, to deceive them. What did he do to our father? He didn't say, I've come to deceive you. He said, I am those who give nasiha. I have come to give you good advice. I want the best for you. You will be like angels. This will be good for you. See to this, no problem. Ma fi mushkila. Eat. Deception. And now what does he do? The same thing. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy has not given the shaitan any power over us. He has zero power. The only thing he is capable of doing is what? Is introducing an idea. Illamma. He puts a little seed. He throws a little whisper. Wiswasa. What do you think of this? you do this, you could be a billionaire. See that beautiful woman go, they just glance. He knows. And how does shaitan come to us? Because this qalb, this fortress of the qalb, which we have to guard, it's like a fortress, has gates. And the gates have keys. So if you handle don't control these keys. One key is the eyes. If you don't guard, and Allah SWT specifies that in the Quran. I mean, it's that important. Believing men, believing women, guard your eyes, lower your eyes. 
Why? It's just a glance. Just a glance. One of the cousins of, uh, of Rasulullah was sitting behind him. Now imagine this scene. Sitting behind the Prophet on his camel. Imagine his, you know, I, I always think of that his chest must be against the back of Rasulullah on the camel like this. He was the son of not Abdullah ibn Abbas, but one of his brothers. And they stopped, and there was a young woman who came to ask something. And so this young man is looking at her, and Rasulullah takes his hands and puts it in front of his eyes in a beautiful way. For what? To protect him from what the shaitan would give. If we don't guard our eyes, and today this is very, very critical, not just for our brothers, which it's even more critical, but for our sisters, because Allah SWT mentions both. Believing men and believing women, who are your eyes? Today, we assault our visual senses. Allah SWT has put, what, you know, 130 million receptors here, 130 million, each one to give you a picture and see his signs. And we sit in front of TV where there is all kinds of fahsha and munkar and every act of disobedience and we spend hours looking at it. Do you think it has no effect on you? That is seriously damaging to the qalb because it stimulates the lower nafs. Even if you are just looking at food channels 24-7 or how to cook, what does it do? It stimulates what part of your nafs? Anybody remember? The cattle-like, the bahimi, because appetite. I need to eat this, I need to eat this, I need to eat this. Whereas, what does Rasulullah teach us? That the worst vessel, the worst container that you can fill is your stomach. With all respect to our beloved people, I have invitations every day to eat somewhere and four meals a day. I'm used to one and a half meal a day. This is their ikram. But it's, it's sometimes it's a punishment. Because how much can you... And then they say, eat more. Out of their love, of course. Eat more. It's just one week. It's one. But it is spiritually harmful. So... Inshallah, after hearing this, our hosts will not insist on eating more. Taste a little bit, Inshallah. What's the rule for eating? What is the Sunnah rule for eating? Can anybody tell me? One third? Okay. How many agree with that? One third food, one third drink, and one third air. How many agree with that? Raise your hands. And the rest disagree? Then you tell me. Do you know this is the last part of the hadith? What is the beginning of the hadith? Rasulullah says, It is sufficient at a few bitelets of food to keep the back straight. He says that's sufficient. Back straight means to give you enough strength that you don't feel weak. But, if you must eat more than that, then this applies. One third food, one third. That's the upper limit. We take that as the norm or the lower limit. And of course we don't stop at that. And I'm talking about myself, especially in the last week. So, do these physical things have some impact that we do on the qalb? Absolutely. What is the proof of that? Let me take an example. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to do wudu. What are we doing? Washing what? External limbs, face. What does he tell us is the effect of this? What is the fadail of wudu? It washes away your sins. Are sins physical? Sins are internal. It's not something physical. What he is teaching us that what you do outside
has an effect on the inside. That's why we are recommended and I recommend if you take nothing from this whole thing is to practice one thing is to be in a state of tahara of wudu at all times. Try your best. Why? Because when you are particular about your external tahara, it will have an impact on your internal tahara. Simply speaking, when you are conscious you are in wudu, you are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you are going to do something, you remind, you're, you're reminded by that, that I am in a state of purity. Because it gives you internal purity. So, and we know the story of Bilal radiallahu anhu. That something to the effect that Rasulullah said, Oh Bilal, what do you do? Because I heard your footsteps ahead of me in Jannah. He said, yeah, Rasulullah, I have nothing special. All I do is, when I lose my tahara, I make wudu and I do turaka salam, that's all. So it's important. Similarly, these external things are important. What does Rasulullah teach us about salah, when we stand in salah? And he was very particular. He said, stand, shoulder to shoulder, ankle to ankles, without gaps. Why? Otherwise, what would happen? And what else? It will make your hearts deviate from each other. Standing shoulder to shoulder and what has it got to do with the Qalb? Again telling you that what we do externally has an impact on what goes on internally. So there are many things that we are taught by Rasulullah and they have an impact on our nafs and our qalb. The kind of nafs that we are trying to develop is what is an angelic or malaiki nafs which only gives you ideas that are beautiful of reminders about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about that attracts you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that invites you to a nafs that's like that is always looking to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's always looking to be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so these are all characteristics that the nafs has the potential of developing and it doesn't have to be that I'm only one type of nafs I have combinations of these things. At moments I may have a malaiki impulse, at other times I may have a shaitani impulse. So what is the process of tazkiyatun nafs is we are trying through this process is to eliminate the shaitani aspect of the nafs, to eliminate the predatory the nafs that harms others, to regulate, not eliminate, the bahimi cattle-like because those are our needs bring it within the Sharia and to enhance and develop those the angelic, the malaiki type of nafs.